Hannah Arendt, who was from Germany and wrote a lot about the Holocaust. She, she was a German Jew. She, she talked about power with and power within, but she also said she didn't believe that power could be destructive, that the true meaning of power was not power over, not coercion, but was a constructive drive. And, and that had to do with building with others who saw the same thing, which would again be community, a building together a, a better world. And a lot of our problem today is the sense of wanting power over. And whether it's through media systems, through leaders, uh, political leaders, through business corporations, it's a sense of there is no win. We lust for a whole life and nothing but less makes people jump out of a comfortable pond into an unknown ocean. Welcome to that journey between the East and the West. Who says Rolling Stones don't gather moss? Hello everyone, I am Meenu Gupta, your host for the day, and I'm delighted to have you join me every week as amazing people share their incredible and inspiring life stories of straddling continents. Thank you. A burning passion. Now, what can that do? A lot, as we all know, depending upon the direction it flows. And what does passion in more than 150 activists across 85 countries and four continents do? It becomes a binding glue to bring about peace and justice in many parts of our globe or our Mother Earth. But can it really solve the multiple conflicts across the world? As the year 2024 began, the headlines of International Crisis Group site were the following. Can we stop things from falling apart? 2024 begins with wars burning in Gaza, Sudan and Ukraine and peacemaking in crisis. Worldwide, diplomatic efforts to end fighting are failing. More leaders are pursuing their ends militarily. More believe they can get away with it. Now, war has been on the rise since about 2012, after a decline in the 90s and early 2000s. First came conflicts in Libya, Syria and Yemen, triggered by the 2011 Arab uprisings, and then they mapped out their own world like an uncontrollable shifting cloud. The past few months, ghastly turn in Israel-Palestine is perhaps the trend's starkest illustration, notwithstanding the conflicts in Sudan, Ukraine, Ethiopia, and, and, and. Where does the problem lie? Is it global politics, climate change, an era of digital technology, or deficit in human compassion and cultural intelligence? Perhaps my guest for today, Catherine Hughes, Pratik can throw some light on these questions, which I'm sure have dotted her life. Catherine is an expert on peace building and social justice. She is one of the three co founders and executive director of Solidarity 2020 and Beyond, an international network of grassroots peace builders, activists, journalists, and scholars in 85 plus countries working on over 100 plus movements across the globe. She sits on multiple boards across continents and is the go-to person for these global issues. She was previously the executive director of Peace Brigades International USA for several years. Having traveled across more than 75 countries, she's definitely gathered enough moss to share some with us today. Thank you, Catherine, for joining me. I see that you've been in the peace building sector or the related sector, so to say from the time of your education in Texas. So the first question I could think of was, how did that happen? Did you choose the field or it chose you or what happened? Because I'm sure that was not so usual, a usual sector picked up by most of your peers. So just do take us through that journey because that will show from where it began and how it panned out. Thank you, Mina. That's um, a really beautiful introduction and framing. I think the main thing is, you're right, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
born in Colorado, and I didn't travel internationally until after college. I always had an extreme kind of curiosity about the world, about other people and other cultures. And I think the main person in my life that really directed me and served as my mentor was my father. His name is Herb Hughes, and he grew up in New Mexico. He ended up doing a lot of things both locally and statewide as a community leader, uh, a statesman. I wouldn't really necessarily say a politician, but he was a city councilor, state banking director, and a number of different positions where he wanted to help shape policy and get back to the community. And I grew up with him at age five. I was helping him run for elections and we would go together to doors and I would knock on doors and say, I'm Catherine and my dad is running for mayor and I'd like for you to support him. And even at that age, I knew how to kind of engage people and all of our talks around the kitchen table. My mom also was very involved in community work and we would talk about these things, about the world, about justice, about fairness. My dad said, told me again and again, no matter what, everyone is of equal value. There is no one below us and no one above us. And he was actually very good friends in his office buildings with people that cleaned the office, that were, were everyday workers. And he really felt a connection and honored them. And they really honored him. He was known to be one of the most honest people that there are. Even the other day, I met some people at a university here who said, oh yeah, we remember your dad. And he was always cared about others and the community and reached across the aisle, which was really beautiful also. There's a lot of stories. So I, I think I learned my sense of justice, of fairness. He was also my tennis coach. I played tennis in uh, high school and into college and we played as a family, but it wasn't about winning. It was always just doing my best and trying to, yeah, trying to model for others. Excellence, trying hard, doing your best, but also being a good loser at the same time when you didn't win. So I think my dad is really responsible for me being involved in community work, wanting to be a peace builder, but also peace with justice. So not just about a lack of violence, but the really positive peace, which means you've got to have justice before you can have peace or it doesn't hold. So you are taking that legacy forward. He left a legacy in you. Yes, very much so. so that sounds awesome. I'm so glad to hear that, actually. So you didn't even have to go about and choose. It chose you. The path I think chose it chose you. me. Yeah. And I, I do think that anyone can become a peace builder or working for justice, and many people do in very many unexpected ways. But I think many of us feel early on, again, kind of this call for justice, for making things right, for really wanting things to be fair and to support the underdog. I Even when I was young, I was the person that was standing in front of dogs that had been hit by cars or refusing to move when a child was being yelled at or hurt and trying to find ways to get through to a parent or even to support them. Because I think that there's, you know, a deep empathy, but it also comes with pain and understanding of other people's suffering. And as someone that has had a lot of white privilege going up in the United States, really appreciating that and hoping that I can somehow, you know, act as a bridge to people that have the wisdom, have the knowledge and the vision for where they need to go, but may not have the access to power or to decision making. And that's, I think, an important part that I've tried to play over the years. And I've learned much more from people I've worked with than I've ever taught. So I'm very appreciative to them. You mentioned that you grew up primarily the first part. Your basic education was in Mexico, right? It was in New Mexico. So the state next to Texas and Arizona, it, it's a really large state, but it's it's less known, I think, than other states. So Ah, okay. Because then I was thinking of Mexico, Mexico, and I was thinking of that great, the divide. One thinks of that great divide. Oh. Yeah, and we talk about it here because if you look at maps over the years, really the U.S. crossed Mexico rather than the other way around. So many people that live here were here from, there's a lot of Native community. It's actually the largest number of tribes and Native community, I think, in the country. I think, I don't know, up to 10 to 15 percent maybe of the population. 
Nation. And it's also, there were many Hispanic settlers that came early on, right after 1492, and Columbus that came both up from Mexico and then over time also came in through Florida. So we have a lot of very old traditional families, both in the Native Americans as well as you know Hispanic Americans. And now uh, what would be called Latinx or, or Chicanos who are mixed with the Natives. And so it's a beautiful culture here. That's something I love about it. It may feel more like Mexico than the U.S. Uh, there's a lot of community. There's a lot of activism. And there's a lot of connection to Mother Earth. And, and appreciation for the fact that this is not really our land that we're settled on and that it is really important to learn from and acknowledge and support people, Native Americans, and also other people that came maybe before the Anglo push, which was for hundreds of years. So there is, there's a really strong feeling, I think, of that in New Mexico that we really love and that calls to us here. That's so, so nice. Actually, it's so nice to hear. And the sense of community, I think, is so important. And that is so lacking in many parts of the world right now, whether it is in the East or the West. It is vanishing in many places and it is building what I call solitary cells. And at times, my fear is that the digital technology is taking over. So on one hand, of course, it's fantastic and it's a great tool. But on the other hand, it is big or it is the tool is taking over the human part of people. And that is, I call, causing deficit in community feeling. And I find that, in my opinion, do correct me, you've been traveling across the globe for peace building, justice, and many more efforts. Do you think if community feeling was there in all the places that you went to, there might be lesser conflict? No, I think that's, it's a great point. And I definitely feel that. Unfortunately, in the so-called kind of global north or quote developed countries, they're actually, we're having a greater loss of community. And it could be that material things have taken over, that values have shifted from family, from caring, from trust, from honesty, from compassion to how how much can I get? And this is what matters, whether it's prestige or material things. And what I've gained, I think maybe partially from living in New Mexico and growing up here. And then, as you mentioned, I went to UT Austin undergrad and then American University and Georgetown for my master's. I think part of what I've learned in New Mexico growing up, we have a much more kind of horizontal society. And I think we have maybe no billionaires. I'd have to check, but when I saw a list, it's a much more equal kind of status, but it, you know, but we also have a lot of poverty, but people have this connection to their families, to their ancestors, to their extended community and responsibility. And I think that's what I found and I've learned from even more in other parts of the world. So for instance, a key part of my life was in 1988, during the first Intifada, you mentioned in the intro, Palestine and Gaza, and I went on a human rights delegation. And that just changed my entire life. I saw amazing people fighting nonviolently for their freedom, for justice against really great odds, and realized that my tax dollars were going to pay for the people that were shooting at me, the military that was torturing people and killing children and taking land. And I then came back and I married into a Palestinian family with a, a journalist that I met. and. That, again, that connection to an Arab family, to being taken in and loved by the 18 brothers and sisters and mother and now hundreds of cousins that my son had, it just showed again, it was that community. It was sticking together. It was building resilience, even in the midst of a curfew or an attack, still having weddings and burrs and celebrations and really holding on to the joy of life. And I found that in every place I've been in Africa, extensively on the ground, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, where you're from, or India and Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, that I've uh, worked in pretty extensively, and in Latin America. And I feel like that is something that my choice to work with grassroots activists, to work with people really on the ground, on the front lines, has been because that's where I see this strong sense of community and responsibility for each other and supporting each other in rough times and not 
you know, being focused on the material things, but around love and compassion and building much more solid and connected communities. And so for me, you mentioned community, that is a huge hope that I have. It's a huge inspiration for how we can fix this very damaged world right now, including in the fields of women's rights and justice and climate crisis and so many other kinds of oppression that we're facing right now. That was actually very explanatory. And thank you for saying all that because I was going to ask you, so a bit of it I got, what constitutes a sense of community? So I would, again, I'm learning. I'm still always learning and being taught, but I would say first a connection to the land, to the place, to the traditions and cultures and rituals that give people strength and direction. I think a connection to community in through your ancestors. So this idea in the US or in the Americas, you know, seven generations back through the natives. And it was very important to look then seven generations ahead and say, what are we doing? What are our decisions? And will they harm or hurt those seven generations? Feeling that we have the energy and the knowledge and learning from our ancestors and the past, but also having a very strong sense of being in the moment of joy, of, as I said, connection and empathy. But I think it's also a sense of of major responsibility to other family members, to your elders, to people that are maybe different from you in your community, whether it's religion or ethnicity or race or whatever it is, feeling respect for others as human beings and as Mother Earth and as part of the creation. And I think that makes such a difference when you're looking at how you prioritize budgets locally or nationally, whether you pay for school and education and healthcare and housing, which I believe are all rights, or whether you pay for bombs and weapons and high tech of some kind, whether you pay for huge industry and dams that might really damage the land and Mother Earth as part of your community, or whether you really look at the holistic picture and how we're all interdependent. I think Thich Nhat Hanh says intra, uh, intra us and inter us. And I love that sense. And to me, I think that is how I view a, a strong and resilient and productive community, but not productive as far as putting out economics, but as far as taking care of each other. That was very well put. Actually, was thinking while you were talking. And I found that the words that you used, connection to the land and ancestors, resilience, they all sort of, the connection to the land and ancestors and the feeling of compassion and belonging in a community, that is what brings about resilience. So I'm going from point A to point B. So having said that, these are the factors which would contribute to a resilient community. And when we say resilient, we would also talk of sustainable livelihoods and all the factors would automatically be there. So just go with my thought. I'm just following yours and I'm taking up from there. I found it lovely because there are immense challenges in every country, different challenges specific to a country. However, if all the world's leaders focused on community building, not pitting one against the other, making it more compassionate, whole, and you, as you rightly said, automatically the thought of, for example, proper insurances and economic progress, automatically those thoughts would follow. How to build resilient communities. If that was the main agenda on the table, do you think there might be lesser conflicts? Oh, certainly. And I think that's a really beautiful framing or way to put it. Peace building, again, I believe has to be what we would call positive peace or peace with justice. So I think a huge part of leadership and good leadership at at the international level, the national level, the, the local level, definitely would look at how to build healthy, resilient communities through the things we're talking about, through sustainable livelihoods, through greater equality and wealth distribution. That's very key through building ways to do win and working together and showing the strength of diversity versus dividing and the divide and conquer concept that's happened so often. And I think a huge part of that from what I've seen is power. 
There are many people that define power differently. I found that some in the progressive community can look down on power and almost kind of give it up. And I think that's because they have experienced the word power to mean power over versus power with or power within. And I think power with and power within are very important and actually very positive things. Hannah Arendt, who was from Germany and wrote a lot about the Holocaust, she, she was a German Jew. She, she talked about power with and power within, but she also said she didn't believe that power could be destructive, that the true meaning of power was not power over, not coercion, but was a constructive drive. And, and that had to do with building with others who saw the same thing, which would again be community a building together a a better world. And a lot of our problem today is the sense of wanting power over. And whether it's through media systems, through leaders, uh, political leaders, through business corporations, it's a sense of there is no win. So as you're saying, if you were to build these resilient, grassroots, bottom-up, sustainable communities that focused on what's good for the future generations, learning from the past, and then really being present in the now, there would be a much more sense of we have power together, the real power. And what I found is to be the key challenge for us is to try to find ways to write that power, to equalize the power of people in the world, both monetarily, politically, you know, many, many ways. And again, against ethnicity or discriminations for your religion or if you're a minority, to really find ways to equalize that power, but also to convince those people that have power over and are using it in a really negative, destructive way that it's also not good for them. They're not usually very happy people. Their families are also at risk, whether it's climate change or other kinds of war or violence they can be targeted. And so really getting a sense of not to be afraid to share power, to build and empower others, because in the end, I think that does end and works toward a sustainable, healthy society and communities. And that would really change the whole look of where we are today, where we're going, and so much violence and oppression that's happening right now around the world. Actually, I love the whole thought process because while you were talking, I'm also thinking, and I see a lot of points linked. If we start from the focus of community building or resilient communities, then all the factors right now which seem to be ailing the planet, which includes climate change, competition for resources, poverty, all these actually would not be there. They seem to arise from that one point, a fallout of a community structure. Wherever it began with industrialization or whatever, because then motivation became more outward. Then it was desire-driven, power-driven, as you rightly said, from the outward. And power comes with, not over. The moment you start going over, then there is no community. And as somebody had very nicely put, a sense of belonging One of my guests had mentioned being seen, heard and acknowledged gives that immense sense of belonging, which I think would also, we are careening towards a very depressed world actually, in isolation. There is no connection. You use the word connection. I found that very vital because you mentioned connection to the land and the ancestors. That is huge, which is being really well-rooted When you feel well-rooted, you feel safer. When you feel safer, you are able to use your creative abilities to grow and to contribute in a positive way to the community around you. So I'm just picking off from a few points you left very beautifully, the gems that you left just now. Phenomenal. I mean, it's very simple, actually. If we just went down to basics, that's it. We strip off all that is built up and we go down to the basics. Use up the goodness of technology then, because if you don't go down to the basics, then technology is going to ruin us. Absolutely. So I loved where our, this thought process took us. Your culture, Catherine, may be very different from that of the places where you travel for mediation or peace building. 
How do you bring about a platform of common understanding? So I again, I think that the key is to understand that the West or me, let's say as an American citizen, doesn't have the answers. I think we've been taught here that we are an exceptional society, that we, again, have all the answers, that we have quality, we are something to look up to as a model. And even many people in the world get fooled to believing that uh, through media. And what I have experienced is when I go other places, keeping open to the fact that I'm going to be taught much more than I'll be teaching, that I have valuable things to teach, mainly because I'm using what I've gathered over many different spaces like a web, and I'm connecting and I'm passing on those pieces of wisdom and knowledge and skills and understanding that others have taught me. So I'm passing them on, and that's really where my ability to teach others or provide ideas and knowledge comes from, not from where I am, but from kind of the composite of what I've learned and what people have shared with me and what they have taught me. When I'm open, when I come with a sense of wanting to learn and share, when I'm coming with a sense of common humanity that we all have families that we want to be happy, we want to grow, we want to be secure. And I think when you mentioned the sense of belonging, I would also say the sense of dignity that people say are much more important sometimes than even, you know, freedoms and again, material equality, that dignity is so key in their societies. Many in the Arab uprising kept time at dignity. Many of the ongoing movements around the world, that is a key thing that they're standing for and looking Looking for. So as long as I respect and I'm open to learning, I have found an extreme acceptance, extreme sharing. Most of the people in Solidarity 2020 and beyond, you mentioned 80 countries, over 100 movements. Now we have over 200 highly skilled and seasoned and knowledgeable activists and organizers and peace buildings, peace builders that are leading these movements and campaign. And we have an extreme connection. We feel very much like a family. People will say that again and again, that we can be sad together and go through grief together, which happens every day. There are people being arrested or tortured or pushed off their land or they're running for their lives. They're becoming refugees. Again, Sudan, this has been happening a lot. All over Southeast Asia, we have people running from Burma and Myanmar, from the DRC is really a lot of violence right now. You mentioned Ethiopia, Gaza, Palestine, there's so many places. And we have come together as a family. We share the pain, but we also prop each other up and celebrate when someone gets a great scholarship or a fellowship or has a great win that they've had within their movement or their campaigns in their community for change. And I've, I've never really felt like a stranger anywhere. Sometimes, if anything, it's when I return home to the U.S. And I have much more culture shock going backwards because, again, of this idea of sterilization and materialization and the values that really are not mine. And it's not that we all across the U.S. there are wonderful people doing wonderful things and trying to change things for the better. But I find in other places in the world that I have a more shared values, believing again in justice with peace and dignity. We share common beliefs for the future, common areas of work together, of our struggle. And yeah, and I, I just feel like I never, I mean, I've always felt welcomed and loved and held and, and shared that we're working for this same goal, for better families, a better world, a safer world, a more dignified world, and, and a, a whole ecosystem, whether it's with feminism or whether it's with anti-oppression, authoritarianism, or self-determination, Western Sahara, Western Papua, Palestine, Tibet, Kashmir. So we're working in all those areas as well. And we all just hold each other up, support each other, even across all of these shallow differences, but the depth, the connection, the same values are shared and that holds us together. And that promotes a sense of strength and I think belonging. That actually sounds very beautiful. And you just said that gives a lot of strength. And I totally understand, again, coming from bottom up, a sense of belonging would contribute to that 
strength because you are bigger than who you are. Essentially, you are bigger than one person. So it's a very different feeling, I'm sure. It's a huge family feeling. Somebody has my back and not there's not just somebody. There are many buddies who have your back kind of feeling. That's actually, the visualization of that is already feels very good, actually. <laughs> you know, a few years ago, I interacted with a European Peace Institute. I will not name it. I was appalled at the lack of cultural competence. And that set me thinking and wondering if the personnel in an institute which teaches peace, which is building peace builders, so to say, lack these skills, what can be said of the world leaders whose decisions behind closed doors define the future of their countries? So what do you think? How much cultural awareness do you see on the ground? So again, I do have to say that I am working with very amazing, aware, empathetic, compassionate people because they have chosen this for their life. And many of them didn't start out as organizers or peace builders or activists, but usually it's something related to, so their land is taken or a war starts or their freedom of speech and freedom of expression is taken away, or they see others nearby, they may have more power, as we we're saying, or status, but others nearby, because of their compassion, they say they're not being treated fairly. And then they get into this field to struggle nonviolently for peace, for justice, for a better world. So they are, I would say, the people I get to work with and that I'm connected to are really the, the best of the best. They're the cream of the crop. So I can't say that everyone out there is this way in every country that I work with, but the people that I work with, they love to learn about other cultures. They love to learn about other languages. They go out and do a lot of research on their own, whether it's through storytelling or through participatory research or through learning from others' experiences. And so I think they are extremely, if we put it that way, culturally competent, understanding the shared values, the shared direction of all people in the world. And that's one of the reasons that they've come together in Solidarity 2020 and beyond and really lead the initiative. One of the things that they've been asking for, and we'll give you an example, for three or four years, we were founded in 20. 20 was an activist program of exchange. So they really wanted to be able to go, for instance, from Kenya to Colombia and learn about how Colombia has handled its peace process or its issues with the FARC or moving toward a transitional justice situation so that they could bring that knowledge back. There are people in Laos that we work with that really want to go to Zimbabwe, where we have a real leader there, Farai, who is working on extractive industry issues. And all of these are kind of impacted by a Chinese influence. And that's very common, even though they're in very different parts of the world. And so there is a sense of wonder at others, at wanting to build awareness, at working across religions. We have all religions, including native religion and indigenous religions that are represented in our group and in the activists that I work with, the leaders and the peace builders. And again, I think the reason I chose to work at the grassroots, I was recruited to be part of the State Department. I was recruited over the years to be involved with, as you said, bigger development agencies or kind of top-down diplomatic spaces. And what I found was this lack of cultural competence a lot of times, but even more than that, a problem because that can be learned is not even wanting and having a desire, right, to learn about others and to understand the excellence that they bring and their history and their culture. Again, sometimes the people I learn the most from you know, as a person sitting at the corner, I remember someone I talked with in Sierra Leone that was selling carved statues of people fishing there and talking to them and hearing from them about their family and vision and values. Sometimes I learn much more than I ever will from a textbook or, as you said, from a major peace agency or top down. And I think it has to do with the bureaucracy and how that can get in the way of moving things and people wanting to hold on to their positions and their salaries and their special places. And what I find is the grassroots understands a lot more and 
wants to learn and understands the importance of these numbers you talked about of working together and building together because at the grassroots really numbers matter. They then are very cultural competent in the way of understanding and learning and sharing and non-discrimination against others because they know that we're all in it together, that we all want basically the same things. And that's going to take a change at the grassroots, which will literally then have to come together and connect both in a bottom up. And then we also look at top down strategies. So they need to come together. But there's so many issues around the world right now that cannot be solved in the locality, in the local issue. You know, you've mentioned this whole international kind of network. And again, I would say power over corporations, media, all of that. If you don't come together to struggle against it, you are not going to have the positive power to change it. And so, again, they understand these things, they teach these things, they live these things, and they have always been my models and what motivates me and keeps me going in a really dark time that we're in right now. Catherine, what I hear is the following. When I see the picture, I have a visual way of thinking. So when I picture what you were just saying, what I see is in all parts of the world, in all the countries, common factor is that there are two parallel roads which are not meeting. So one, as you clearly described, are the grassroots peace builders who are open, compassionate, they want community, they are looking at sustainability and they are looking at peace and they feel for the other because the other is not the other. It's not I versus them. So that power over is not there. It's power with, we are powerful, is what counts. What I also see is another road completely separate where the thinking and the feeling is very different. So there is no connection. There is only power over where bureaucracy comes in. What I feel and what I'm getting the sense of from what you said and what I read every day and hear every day, that is power politics. And that is where global politics lies. So that is one road. And there's another road. Now, unfortunately, in most of the countries, it is like this. There are two parallel roads, which these two roads are not coming together. I'm just forming a picture from our discussion, how we are talking. And the picture is becoming very clear. So, and what I'm also understanding, okay, which of these two roads would be better for the earth and her people? And I automatically choose this first road, where we are talking of, compassion, community, no borders, people who are not looking at where you also said you learn more, people wanting to learn more and not saying, oh, my way is the right way or the highway. And while the other side is saying, my way is the right way. So how? Now you've been in the field, you've been around for that many years across continents. What I just said, does it make sense? Oh, yeah. I mean, it definitely makes sense. And I think the big challenge then is to figure out how to merge the two, how to to build from the grassroots and model. And I hate the word really scale up because I don't think everything needs to be scaled up or works through scale. Up, but I do think that it's important to share models and be able to learn from what has worked or what hasn't worked. And I'm picturing what you're saying. It's the idea of conflict transformation. So it's the idea of finding ways for those grassroots people, their experience, their wisdom to connect again, the word connect, and to find ways to bring in or convince or show the beauty of what they have and what they're offering for their vision for the future to some of these other levels that are functioning out there with this sense of power over and the ones that are not so focused on collective good, but maybe their own good or their own country's good or their family status. And I think, again, this idea of conflict transformation which it's a spectrum. So there can be nonviolent action involved, the idea of learning to live in a nonviolence philosophy. There, again, can be kinds of struggle because all conflict is not bad. I think that's important to mention. We definitely teach that to create change, 
And these power structures, you need conflict many times. You need to disrupt the way things are, the status quo, which can be very oppressive and very unfair. But the idea and the, the practice and the skill is finding ways to keep that nonviolent to keep that in a way where it doesn't harm people, but it can disrupt harmful systems and then lead to positive and constructive systems. And again, we're, we're looking at a more horizontal system that we would like to create. And you mentioned kind of these two parallels. So if you do have a more horizontal system, how do you find ways that you ask and you gather and you find ways to build alliances and build the numbers and kind of encourage compass and include these other kinds of groups as you're growing and as you're shaping the world. And that takes, I think, a lot of understanding, a lot of understanding of nonviolent communication and dialogue and mediation can be very important, which are very important peace building skills, conflict resolution, but not, again, shying away from important conflict to disrupt unjust systems and laws and rules, what many people have called the good trouble, making good trouble. And so, yeah, and so that's what I would see is that the, the grassroots can't do it all, they need other parts of the society. They need those parallel groups that may have more access to power, that may have access to policy making and decision making, that may have or always have way more resources, whether it's material goods, whether it's food, whether it's housing, whether it's access to build those things, whether it's media. So the, the big challenge is how do you build those things together? How do you influence, struggle, create a better vision so that other people, even those that have this unequal power and unequal influence, how do you bring them in to you and to your way of thinking and your visioning so that you are working together for a better world and you're not always fighting with each other? And so, as you said, it's not us or them, but it becomes us together. Okay, so hold that thought, because now I'm going to give a humble suggestion, my humble opinion, just based purely on what we are talking about and what I'm hearing from you, because I listen well. Attitude, it is said very wisely, attitude is a small thing, but it can bring about the biggest changes. And from where I see, and I'm on the outside, I have the aerial view, I'm not on the inside, really. What I see is you and people like you. There would be, I'm sure, golden nuggets like you as well, who are exactly right there in between, the bridge between the two parallel roads, who know both the sides, who can feel both the sides and know from where both are coming from. Why these two roads, the people on these roads cannot see that. You need a pair of glasses. You use the word vision. In order to see something there, you need another pair of glasses to see that picture. And that pair of glasses is an attitude, an open attitude. That is it. Just a very small thing, the key. And if, let's say, when we were talking of the picture which came up, when we talked of community, resilient communities and what would that world be it was such a beautiful wonderful warm picture i got a world where there is no competition for resources there's no problem of climate change or sustainability that is the final picture i saw while you were talking however when i think of this other road we are talking of bureaucracy, we're talking of cold politics and economic power and power. I feel a sense of coldness. I don't feel warm. The picture that I see at the end of that road, it is destroy world, people fighting with each other, conflicts increasing. This is the picture I see when I try to look into the future. So now when I see two futures, this is one future, very nice, beautiful, warm, very deeply connected, a human future. When I see the other one, I begin with a sense of coldness, isolation, one over the other, competition. That is what I see. Now, you as a bridge can give that pair of glasses for the people in the other picture to try and see, because that is the only way to see that vision, and just an attitude shift. Okay, let me just sit back and see that picture. Oh, how did that picture come about? And then try to relearn, unlearn and relearn, 
because this picture cannot happen till unlearning happens. And unlearning is the most difficult thing. But it also begins with an attitude. Because if world leaders started seeing this in dots that, oh, we need to focus on resilient community, we really would not be sitting and having conventions and tables of sustainable conferences. We wouldn't have that. We would have conferences of different countries talking about, okay, how did you build up that community? How did that happen that many years ago? How can we do this? How can we replicate that? We would have those conferences. In my opinion, we need those conventions. We need thousands and millions of dollars coming in those conventions, not killing one bird. Ah, we've just killed one. But then the people killing that one bird, people who are talking about sustainability, the countries are the ones who are actually sustainability. Dis- so without throwing stones and without blaming and so on, I'm talking very objectively from the viewpoint of the points that you meant, the beautiful nuggets you just put out. I'm just trying to add up the points and it showed me a very clear picture. If I, in a few minutes, could see two different worlds and two clear roads, I leave the rest to your imagination. Yeah, no, and I think that's why people like you who listen well and your podcast and the work you've done, I think a huge part of it, I definitely agree with the attitude and shifting. And I think it has a lot to do with deep listening. Until you really can sit and listen and learn and watch and experience from others in a different space of life, then you it's really hard to unlearn or relearn and it's hard to maybe have a positive attitude or even to believe that can happen. And so you rationalize that will never happen, we'll never have a fair space, human beings are basically bad, our future is dog eat dog, and if we've got to be the one on top, because we don't want to be the one on the bottom. And if you can deeply listen to people and walk with them and share with them their family, their traditions, their rituals, I think that is what makes it possible to understand that, no, that I believe humans have both great joy and brilliance and sacrifice in them for the good. And then we also have the dark side. And as you said, it's kind of where our attitude sits. It's where we put our energy into this positive vision and work and hope, even in darkest times versus thinking it's all lost and we're bad and we have to just climb on top and find the best way to do that. And so I think, again, that's the other part of the grassroots is I've lived with people all over the world. When I go places, I rarely stay in hotels as a trainer or as a policy maker or a peace builder. I much would rather prefer to sleep on the floor in a refugee camp in Gaza and eat with people and learn from them, which I've done many times before the ongoing genocide that's happening right now, which is horrendous. I have shared in Cameroon with trying to drive from one place to the other in an Anglophone side that has extremely poor resources Resources and it's very oppressed right now, huge ruts in the road and no bathrooms. And the women that are selling marketplace sales, watching them teach each other, not through language or written because they haven't learned to read or write, but to be able to do plays and to be able to act it out and to be able to just ask for a decent bathroom so they don't have to go behind the cars in the parking lot when they're spending all day selling their vegetables or their fruit to support their families. So I think that deep experience with each other, walking in someone else's shoes, a deep listening and understanding, that would go a huge way toward this idea of, of, as you said, an attitude shift and to really a shift internally. One of the things I think about or I was thinking about, I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow and I was at Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. It was the mid-career program in 2020 when this um, international network was founded. And what I've seen over the years since as a Rotary Peace Fellow is example of Rotarians. It's one of the largest community social groups around the world. And most of them, not all of them, are very well off, well placed, have this kind of power over in the society, are business people, are leaders in their communities. And what I've seen from them is that they very much are trying to learn from 
others are trying to, while they're giving their funds and their resources, which is what I'm also trying to bridge to get some of these important funds and resources to areas that need them. Right now, we're working on a big grant for Kenya that empowers women, uh, and it's called Seek Africa. We're almost done with, with that and getting it approved. And then in Nepal, we're starting to work on one for disability rights and people that were injured during the earthquake in 2014, but also have been born hard of hearing, without sight, who are in wheelchairs, and who are very much discriminated against in their society in various ways. So the Rotarians, that's a place I can see Rotary Peace Fellows, many of us who are part of the alumni, trying to bridge this situation where they are giving humanitarian aid, are giving funds that are very much needed and appreciated, but they also at the same time, many of them are wanting to learn, are wanting to go to these places, visit, and get to know the people they're working with, not just giving a handout. And again, that is a place where I see transformation shifts. There's now a huge peace building group from within the Rotarians that are working against nuclear war, are working to redirect funds to the military, especially in the global north, to needs in the global south, or even within our own communities of the unhoused and healthcare issues and so many problems that we're dealing with as well, and mental health issues in our society. So that's a place when you mention that as an example where it's not there yet. There are still some people that see this top-down view of the world or vision of the world, but there are many that are really trying through their support and through their humanitarian side to travel, to learn, to have people come speak, to really walk with people that are grassroots. And so that's, again, a place where I see some bridging happening and some real hope that can transform attitudes and understanding and it it comes, I think, with deep listening. That's very important. But also sharing, being willing to share the risks, being willing to share some of the hardships uh, and the sacrifices that these amazing grassroots leaders are exhibiting and are teaching people. You know, to carry that forward, if I had to have a visual, the axis on which the earth is rotating right now, attitude would shift that axis and you would have a different world. But coming down to something else which occurred to me while you were talking, when you married into a Palestinian family, a sense of community, Palestinian family, etc., the issue what is going on, that has been going on for many years and now it is at a different level of escalation, it must be very close to you on the Gaza Strip, whatever is happening. And that, dear listeners, is the first part of my animated conversation with Catherine for the reality in the Gaza Strip and the horrors unfolding there as well as possible solutions do tune in to the next episode. Thank you for listening to the series Between the East and the West. Do subscribe to the channels mentioned on the site in case, of course, you liked what you had I am Meenu Gupta, the host of the series, and I'll be looking forward to your comments. We love feedback. Thank you once again. Namaste and bye-bye.